Hello, so this is the Franco-Prussian War. Um, these images are, this is uh, the German Confederation. In red, this is the Northern Confederation. And in orange, this is the uh, Southern Confederation. Now the Northern Confederation is led by Prussia, which is this large red area, okay? Um, what they are going to do in the Franco-Prussian War is they will go to war with France and what they will demand is this section of land right here called the Alsace-Lorraine. And they will also hope to unite the Northern Confederation with the Southern Confederation into one German Reich or empire. This is a painting of French troops mobilizing for the war. And here are uh, Prus the Prussian soldiers doing the same thing. Now, if you recall from the last time that we spoke, the the leading events that caused the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War actually have to do with the Spanish succession in which a uh, German was going to be placed on the, the throne of France, I'm sorry, of Spain, and uh, France objected. Um, the German was forced to withdraw, and this will lead to um, really what is the orchestration by the the Prussian chancellor, his name is Otto von, Binmark, von, von Bismarck, into a series of events that will lead to... Um, the French actually declaring war on, on Prussia itself. So the man who was in charge of designing the Prussian response to the, the French uh, declaration of war is Helmuth von Moltke. He's called the elder because his nephew is going to have uh, pretty much the same position as commander of the German uh, army in World War One. So the, the events unfold in this, this way. Uh, France is going to order the mobilization of its troops on July the 14th. This means that they're calling up their, uh, their, their forces, the army, uh, that, would, that would be the cavalry, the infantry, the artillery. And the following day, the Germans, uh, or the Prussians, they follow suit and they begin to mobilize as well. And then four days later, the French will officially declare war on, on, on the Prussians. Now, the French take longer to mobilize their forces than the Prussians do. The, the Prussians are prepared and they, they quickly mobilize their forces and they will attack France. France declares war on Prussia, but they never are, are able to actually uh, invade uh, very far into, um, into Prussian territory. This area right here called the Sarsbrücken, this is the only area really in which the, uh, the French will uh, be able to attack inside of Prussia. The rest of these, uh, uh, Chalons, Metz, Strasbourg, Belfort, Paris, these are all inside of France, and these are areas which the, uh, the Prussians, along with their allies, which are other German states, will um, attack. One of the things to understand about the Franco-Prussian War is it's, it is you know, 40 years um, before the outbreak of World War I, but in many ways it's uh, a pre-war. And what I mean by that is Moltke's goal is to take Paris. The Germans' goal in both World War I and World War II will be to take Paris. The, the French will respond with a series of fortifications and the positioning of their army in this area right here, which they will do again in the second, First and Second World War. But also notice that the French will begin to blockade Germany with its uh, its navy, which is something they're going to do in World War One and they'll attempt in World War Two. But then the French are also going to use their uh, troops from their their colonies, okay? And in this case, they're going to bring uh, African troops uh, from like Algeria, Morocco, and they'll be incorporating them into the the, the first corps, which which is right here under uh, General McMahon. So just quickly, these are the major battles. There are more battles that are involved, but at the Battle of Wissenberg, uh, this is an intense door-to-door -door battle um, of, of survival of the troops inside of this town, uh, and it ends up with uh, the French surrendering to the Germans. Now, what is pretty clear from this battle is that the French rifle is, is able to shoot further and more accurately, and it inflicts heavy casualties on the Germans. However, the Germans have very powerful, uh, accurate, and long-range artillery, and they are able to use that to great effect to break up an otherwise um, better French army. Now, at the Battle of um, Spickenren, the French are going to withdraw, and the Germans will suffer high casualties, but because the French withdraw, 
this leads to uh, a German victory as well. Then at the Battle of Worth, this is another German victory, but by this point it's very clear that the Chasspot rifle that the French have is, is very superior to what the, the Germans have. The Germans have what's called the needle gun. Um, you have to get closer range. It's not as, uh, as accurate. And this chest pot uh, rifle inflicts heavy casualties on the Germans again. So the thing that turns this, these three battles and eventually the war itself is the Germans' superior use of their artillery. Okay, They use that as a counter because they can fire it further and they can um, sort of protect their own infantry from having to get too close uh, to to be chewed up essentially by the French uh, rifles. And the French also have, and so do the Germans, they have early forms of like a machine gun, uh, but it's not quite the same thing, okay? But it is an, a weapon that can be fired very quickly. At the Battle of uh, Mars La Tour, this is a, a draw because both sides suffer really heavy losses in terms of men and number of officers, and officers are difficult to replace. Um, this really should have been a battle that the French won, but the French leadership um, really failed here because they, they didn't realize um, that the Prussians had misjudged and overplayed themselves and that the French actually outnumbered the Prussians 5-1 to one on this, this point. Uh, this could have been a, a really key um, turning point for the, the French because they would have been able to use these, um, this French army to support other French armies in the area. But they, they just failed to do that. So even though the, the French do have a superior rifle, their leadership is not as um, – it's not up to par with the, the Prussians. So one thing to look at this is that even though the Prussians are outnumbered, they're able to hold the French for a full day, even though they're outnumbered 5 to 1. Uh, next is the Battle of uh, Gravelotte. Gravelot. Uh, this is the, actually the largest battle of the war, and there are severe casualties in the tens of thousands on both sides. Um, uh, but the French will actually end up running out of ammunition to continue the fight, and they will retreat to Metz. Now, what they're trying to do is actually get to Verdun, which is a, a major uh, it's a major fort, and it has a lot of uh, weapons, and they'll be able to resupply. However, they will be cut off, and they will be forced instead to retreat to the city of Metz. And here, uh, the French army of the Rhine, they'll retreat to the fortress that's at Metz, and the Germans will completely surround the fortress itself. They will, the Germans will try to bombard and then storm the fortress and defeat the French, and they will actually fail. And so what they resort, is, resort to is just starving the French into submission. Uh, this will result, though, uh, in a major uh, French, I'm sorry, major German victory. Now, as a result of what happens here, um, at, at Metz, a new army is formed, and it is led by uh, Napoleon III and General Patrice McMahon. And the idea is, is they will march this new army uh, to alleviate the, the encircled army of the Rhine. What ends up happening, though, is at Sedan, the French army will be surrounded by the Prussians again. This is a, another army. Another, the tactics are the same. Okay. One of the things that happens on one of the outskirts of town is uh, the French will attempt to break the allies of the, the Prussians. Um, I be believe it's the Bavarians. And what they do is, is they're going to employ tactics like this is a sniper firing in. The thing of it is, is it doesn't really work. Um, the, they'll run out of ammunition. They'll be encircled, uh, and they'll be ultimately defeated. But what's interesting about, this is a painting of, of those events, which will be later actually made into a movie, but you can see the French army. Uh, they're wounded. They have the, you can tell it's they're French because they have of their, their uniform. Um, but they have a, a black soldier. Uh, so this is someone from Africa. So we have an army which is made up of different uh, parts of the, the French empire. And you've got a guy wearing a turban. Like ultimately, though, they'll, they'll they'll run out of ammunition and they will be defeated. So things go pretty badly for the French uh, at Sedan. Like I said, they are encircled, and what will end up happening is, is the same thing that happened in the other battles, which is that even though the French have a superior uh, rifle, the Germans will um, encircle, force the French into a concentrated area, uh, like a 
uh, fortress, and then they will open fire with their uh, artillery. The artillery is, is better than what the French have. They can't really counter it. And what ends up happening is, is uh, after a day of fighting, Napoleon III will, um, he comes to the realization that, like, you know, being surrounded and being the force that was supposed to save the force, the army of the Rhine, which was itself uh, encircled, like, this is it, it's over. So Napoleon orders uh, General Real here, this guy right here, you can tell he's French because he's wearing red pants, to um, surrender. And this is William I, the Prussian king. So here we have uh, Napoleon, and he's seated next to, uh, this is Otto von Bismarck, the chancellor. He's the political leader under the, the king, King William of Prussia. So Napoleon is going to die a couple of years later, and he's going to ask if, uh, you know, were they, meaning him, were they uh, cowards? And the reality is, is that, you know, he was leading the army that was supposed to uh, give support to the Army of the Rhine. The Army of the Rhine was captured. Now you've got this second army that was captured. Um, it was unlikely that the French were going to be able to uh, call forth another army that would be able to alleviate the uh, besiegement of Sedan before you know all of the people died because the the German artillery was accurate and devastating and they were going to either run out of food the French were going to either run out of food or ammunition and it's not as if the French didn't try to break out of Sedan I mean they did but they were turned back at each each time so now Bismarck he wants the war to be over quickly because he realizes um, first that if this war goes on too long, that the the public opinion of Europe will shift against Germany, and even public opinion inside of um, the German Confederation, because it is it's a confederation. It's made up of different parts of the German Confederation. The largest part is the Prussians, which is what uh, Bismarck is the head of, right? But you know, if the war goes on too long, other parts of the coalition might say, eh, "We don't want to keep fighting this this war." So what the Germans want is it's pretty moderate terms. They want some money and they want territory. They want specifically this area called the Alsace and the Lorraine. The French, though, they make it clear that they're not going to give up anything, that they're going to fight to the end. They're, they won't give up any land. They won't give up any fortresses, nothing. So this is um, the Watch on the Rhine. This is a, a famous um, song that comes about during this time. It goes, the cry resounds like thunder's peal, like crashing waves and clang of steel. The Rhine, the Rhine, our German Rhine, who will defend our stream divine? Dear fatherland, no fear be thine. Dear fatherland, no fear be thine. Firm and true stands the watch, the watch at the Rhine. Firm and true stands the watch, the watch at the Rhine. They stand a hundred thousand strong, quick to avenge their country's wrong. With filial love, their bosoms swell. They shall guard the sacred landmark well. Dear fatherland, no fear be thine. Dear fatherland, no fear be thine. Firm and true stands the watch, the watch at the Rhine. Firm and true stands the watch, the watch at the Rhine. He casts his eyes to heaven's blue, from where past heroes hold the view, and swears pugnaciously the oath, you, Rhine, and I, stay German both. So the idea here is, is you've got this movement towards nationalism. These people who are German, but are in all of these different states. Remember, we've talked about the old Holy Roman Empire, which doesn't exist anymore, but now it's the German Confederation. And instead of being a confederation, which is this loose form of government, there's this movement towards one strong, unified Germany, okay, led by uh, the, the Prussian king, who is uh, William. So this is the land right here. So here's the Rhine River, okay? And the Germans are saying that, you know, this is their God-given right. It's divine, okay? And this is what they're fighting over. We're fighting for, one of the things, anyways. So here's the Lorraine, and here's the Alsace. Okay, it's right here. One of the things that happens as a result of the uh, Franco-Prussian War is we have a new kind of nationalism that comes to the fore in Europe. That's obviously shown first in, in Germany and France, but this is the grave of Ignis Hoff. He is a uh, French sergeant who... Uh, is in Paris and he leads um, like raids on the Prussians who will eventually surround the city and uh, he's pretty he's quite successful um, so much so that he'll have a bounty put on his head by the, the Prussians 
but the French will use the Parisians specifically. Their press will write about him and his exploits and his ability to uh, escape capture and to inflict damage on the, uh, the Prussians. Meanwhile, the Prussians, though, they will use the militarism and the ability of the French to, or I'm mean, sorry, of the Prussians to defeat the French. They will use this as a, as a, um, as a way to nationalize, to show that their strength, the strength of the Prussian people or the German people is through their military. And they'll see proof of this in their ability to liberate, as they would see it, the Rhine from the, the French into its rightful place, which is, and under their belief, the, the German people. So some things that were uh, built during this, uh, this time is, this is called the Victory Column. It's in Berlin. And then this is the Brandenburg Gate. Now the Brandenburg Gate had already been there. But this column right here was built um, to commemorate the victory of the combined German forces of uh, the German Confederation and Austria against the uh, uh, the Danes. Okay, and then you have the Brandenburg Gate, and this is to commemorate the Battle of Sedan. And it's um, I gotta X it out of here real fast. Sorry. It says in uh, this is what it says in German, and what it says in English is what a change through God's guidance. And so the idea here is, you know, before they went to war with France, the Germans were a disunited people. And then after the war with France, they become a united people. And they're saying that this is, you know, God's will. What I think is interesting is this is the Reichstag, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Capitol. This is where the uh, German parliament meets. And then, you know, down a boulevard, you have the victory column. And here's our capital. And then down the plaza, you have the Washington Monument. It's interesting how... Different countries will use the same uh, format to, to show their symbols. And then if you've been to Washington, which I know many of you have, and you had a chance to go up the Washington Monument, this is uh, an idea. Here's a person standing right about there, right? So it's, it's these are tall. Uh, this is a painting by Jean-Louis Ernest Messonnier about the siege of Paris. A lot of symbolism here. You've got death in the sky symbolized by the crow you've got the black smoke right then you've got the lighter colors so it's interesting so when napoleon is defeated the french don't just throw in the towel and say we're done instead they say okay <laughs> we're, we're dumping napoleon uh and instead what we're going to do is get rid of the second french empire and we will start the third french republic and so the battle of sedan was the first and the second and the new government will be formed on September the 4th. So the French are not done. And this government is called the, the government of national defense. So this is an illustration in the, the London news. So it's a London newspaper and it's describing what's happening in, in Paris. And it shows discussing the war in Paris. And there is all kinds of things to be discerned from this particular uh, image. You have people reading uh, and discussing what's happening. You've got uh, men, working class people, discussing with the French uh, military, like what to do and how to do it. Uh, you've got a man consoling a woman, probably who's found out about her husband or brother or somebody who's died. But the, it's interesting to think that this is a war that is happening between the French and, and the Prussians, right? But the press is there and is relaying back because of the availability of um, the telegraph information to London or uh uh, New York or Berlin or uh, Rome, Madrid, Moscow. And so this is a uh, conflict which is, while it's happening in a specific area, it's being discussed uh, more broadly. More from the, the London Times, students going to man the fortifications. So the siege itself, the siege of Paris, um, Ottoman Bismarck wants the victory to happen, but he doesn't want it to happen too quickly. Um, and the reason why is if it's too bloody, it could turn public opinion away from what up to this point was a resounding German victory. So the Germans, they do begin to besiege the city of Paris in October 1870. And throughout the um, bes uh, besiegement, the discussion between von Moltke and uh, Bismarck is, do you, uh, do you bombard the city or do you not? Uh, the French will make uh, attempts to break out of the city, and they fail to do so by land uh, and by water. The Germans are going to encircle the city. Uh, von Moltke is very slow and methodical, and he does this because he doesn't want the, the French um, to be able to escape or to penetrate any sort of weakness on the side of the Germans. 
So the conditions in Paris are going to steadily get worse because this um, besiegement and encirclement begins in October and it will last until January of 1871. So there's no food coming in. However, the Parisians will take great pride in their ability to resist uh, falling to the Germans. So the, the Germans understand, uh, and definitely Bismarck knows, that the longer that this siege goes on, the, the less appetite there will be in Germany or in other European uh, governments for this war to continue. So he's looking for a way to, to end the war. One of the things that the French do, the Parisians do, it, to um, to show their their resistance is they will use what at that time would be a modern technology, which is balloons, hot air balloons. They will fly out of the city. Okay. Now, this is a very small amount of people who can do this, right? This is for the wealthy. However, even though Paris is completely encircled by Germans, this does not mean that they're not able to... Uh, communicate they're doing it by the balloons but also by carrier pigeons carrier pigeons were were used um pretty extensively the germans once they had encircled paris they could just cut the uh the telegraph lines but it's not as an easy thing to do to to shoot down carrier pigeons you can but um over 1.1 million private and official communications are delivered by birds okay so there's a lot of birds to shoot down if you're trying to shoot them down um, there's also a regular balloon uh, mail service, so uh, there's over 60 flights that are carried carried out, and they, they have photographically reduced letters. So you would take a picture and you just shrink it down. And the way that I could explain this that you might understand is if you when you were a child you might have had like a, a viewfinder. It's where it's like a circular uh, uh, like a card that you put into this device that looks like a pair of binoculars, and then you pull the uh, the switch down and it shows you different images. And that's exactly what they've done. They've taken uh, photos of much larger documents, placed them on smaller uh, templates, and then you know it reduces the weight because these these balloons can't carry a lot of weight. So even though they continue to have communication and the balloons are used as a way for the rich to flee the city, um, this does not mean that like goods are being brought into the city. There's just no way that this technology could keep up with the demands for um, for food. So the Parisians are going to resort to eating um, the dogs and the cats and then eventually the rats because there's no more beef, pork, chicken. Um, so things aren't good. Um, so Bismarck believed, I mean, he's quoted as saying, a week without cafe au lait will break the Parisians. However, the Parisians, to, to their, uh, you know, they're, they're very stoic. They do not just give in. And so they're forcing the Germans to have to make a decision. Do you storm the city, which is going to inflict a lot of losses and could force the hands of the, uh, the British or the Austrians or the Russians to get involved? Or do you use, you know, the gun, the, the artillery? This is a Prussian 150 millimeter uh, Krupp gun. The Krupp is known today because they make like, uh, like coffee pots and things like that. But they made weapons back then. And this is the artillery piece that they would have placed inside of this uh, artillery gun and then fired on the city itself. This is a, a famous example of the siege. This is the 99th day of the siege. So this is the Christmas menu. Um, and this would have been uh, something that a rich person attending a uh, restaurant could have ordered uh, stuffed donkey's head, elephant consomme, roast camel, kangaroo stew, antelope terrine, uh, bear ribs, cat with rats, and then wolf haunch in deer sauce. So you can tell that by this point, they've um, pilfered the, the zoos of Paris. So in January 1871, things uh, really begin to change in the battle, it's in, in the war itself. Um, Mulkey orders this limited shelling of the city of Paris on the advice of, of Bismarck. So Bismarck is making a power play. Mulkey is the head of the army. Bismarck is the head of the, uh, the German government. So we have two different views, and clearly Bismarck's sway is, is taking hold. Uh, on January the 18th, um, uh, the Prussian king, William I, will be crowned Kaiser Wilhelm of the German Empire, or the German Reich. And this is done at this, the Palace of Versailles in France. On January 25th, um, Kaiser Wilhelm will elevate Bismarck to a position above Mulkey, and uh, Bismarck will immediately order the, the Krupp guns to begin to fire on Paris. 
and very quickly uh, the Parisians' resistance will, will crumble and the, the French will seek an armistice, an end to the war. Now the Germans will briefly enter into the city of Paris, but they also leave quickly. It's more of a show than anything else. And this is what I mean by that. So the, the Parisians will hold a, uh, a military parade through the city as a show of their, you know, it's a way of showing their strength. It's a, a, a way to uh, commemorate the, the formation or the unification of, of Germany into the German Empire. This is the Hall of Mirrors. And this is important, you guys, because this is the very place at which the end of World War I will be dictated. Okay, It was not by accident that the French picked the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. It's because the Germans will declare themselves an empire and elevate this guy, the French, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Prussian king, William I, to the status of Kaiser of the German people. These are the German aristocrats of the various German states. And here they are declaring their loyalty to the Prussian king, okay? Kaiser Wilhelm I. And this is Otto von Bismarck. And this is Molke right here. So what brings about the end of this war is the Treaty of Frankfurt. It's signed in May 1871. Uh, France will cede the regions of the Alsace and Lorraine, which includes nearly 1,700 villages. This is a lot of people. This affects a lot of, of, of French citizens. Um, this region is important not only because of its location on the Rhine, but also because underneath of it is uh, large iron deposits. And this is also the, an industrialized area of France. So there are machine shops which will be taken by the, the, the Germans. This is gonna cause massive dislocation of people because the people that are living in the Alsace Lorraine, they're given a choice. Either become a German citizen, become part of the new German empire, or remain a French citizen, but you have to leave. So the French government, they will try to alleviate this displacement of these French people by giving them uh, good land in Algeria in which to resettle. France is going to be forced to pay 5 billion francs um, to Germany over the next three years, so from 1871 to 1874. Now, the way that the French government is going to be able to raise this money, because 5 billion francs at that time is a significant amount of money, um, is they will pass a law that will force the repayment of all rents and debts within a 48-hour period. Um, and this is going to fall the heaviest on the people of Paris, which we've talked about Paris and how the Parisians, when they are uh, upset, remember about the bread, uh, it'll lead to them revolting. So we'll see. That's what's going to happen in the, the next part, which that'll be the next presentation. So... Germany, in order to make sure that it gets paid by the French, they will continue to occupy parts of French territory as an indemnity until they've been paid off, and then that's it. This is a famous painting, so you've got the German standing over top, and you know they don't wear this stuff, but the idea here is, is there's this mythos. You've got the, the German warrior, blonde hair, blue-eyed, you know where that's going, I hope. And then here you have the French. That's the, their symbol, broken sword. So now the next time that we talk, we'll talk about the Paris Commune and what happens there. But until then, this is what Europe is gonna look like after 1871, which you should recognize from uh, you know, either World War I, uh, when the United States gets involved. All the major players are in place from 1871 until 1919. You've got the, the British, you've got the French, the Italians, Austria-Hungary, we have the German Empire, Russian Empire, and here's the Ottoman Empire, okay? So that's that. Thanks, guys.